Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Hughes, and I'm the Interim Dean here at the Emory Law School. And welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize our featured speaker and many of our uh, esteemed guests today, of course, Justice Sotomayor. Uh, and also, we uh, welcome members of the state and federal judiciary here in Georgia. Uh, we have judges from the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Uh, the United States District, Magistrate, and Bankruptcy Courts for the Northern, Middle, and, Di and Southern Districts of Georgia, uh, the Court of Appeals for the State of Georgia, the State Court of, Fulton, of DeKalb County. And we also have President Stark and senior administrators here at the university, uh, Emory Law faculty, staff, and students. So welcome on, one and all. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, especially thank uh, Professor Fred Smith, Jr. for his role in organizing this discussion. Uh, Fred is a scholar of constitutional law in the federal judiciary, uh, and he was a clerk for Justice Sotomayor during the fall uh, 2013 term. Uh, he joined the Emory Law School from the University of California Berkeley faculty uh, recently, and he previously served as an associate at the Atlanta law firm of Bondurant, Mixon, and Elmore. Uh, his scholarship has appeared in a number of prominent journals, and I suspect that you might be familiar with some of them. Uh, the Harvard Law Review, the Stanford Law Review, the Columbia Law Review, the New York University Law Review, the Fordham Law Review, and many more. Uh, Professor Smith earned his JD at uh, Stanford Law School and his BA from Harvard University. So before we get started with uh, President Stirk's welcome remarks, uh, I need to attend to a few housekeeping matters if you'll permit me to do so. Um, at the conclusion of our formal conversation, uh, Professor Smith will lead us in a question and answer session, uh, and the questions of course have been submitted previously from members of the audience. Um, I'd also like to remind you that there is no, there should be no cameras, no flash photography uh, permitted today unless you are a member of the press who has been pre-approved to do so. Um, also, if you would, please make sure, certain that your cell phones are on silent at this time. And so now I'd like to invite uh, to uh, the stage uh, Professor, it's not Professor, President uh, Claire Stark of Emory University to welcome you. Well, one more good afternoon, and Dean Hughes, I like being called a professor over being called a president, so it's an honor, particularly for this occasion, to be referenced as such. I want to thank Professor Smith for making this possible. Um, without him, we wouldn't have this visit, and we wouldn't have this opportunity to really come together as an intellectual community and, and think tough about what's going on in life and in the world and what our responsibilities are. I want to especially thank Justice Sotomayor for being with us today. We can only imagine, and that's all we can do because we have no real idea how chaotic your life is, and it's a real honor to have you here. I think it's probably safe to say that many of us, if not all of us, will remember this day for very long times to come. And I don't know if you feel it, but the energy in this hall just to me resembles the excitement that there is about having you with us today but also you're challenging us to sort of step back, reflect, and think about where we are, what we do, why we do what we do, and where we want to go. I also would like to recognize the fact that the significance of the justice's visit to our campus, and especially Emory Law, which just has entered its second century. For 100 years, actually I should say for 100 plus years, Emory Law has trained the highest caliber of professionals for careers in law, and for service to the public good. Professor Smith is just one of many examples. Our faculty strive to imbue each new generation of students with the skills necessary for reasoned, critical, compassionate debate and for ethical practice in the field of law and beyond. The rule of law and the fair application of those laws are of central importance in maintaining a civil society 
and in upholding the democratic process. I went over that fast. You will hear much more about that, but the rule of law is more important now than it ever has been. I know that generations keep repeating that and saying that. I actually do believe that there's something very important about this moment in our history where that certainly is the case. The judiciary branch of government plays a crucial role in addressing the perceived ambiguities in the law. That is why justices like Justice Sotomayor are so valued and are so needed today. Since joining the Supreme Court, the justice has left the words she wrote in 2001 when she served as a U.S. Court of Appeals judge in the Second Circuit. And if you allow me, I'd like to quote you. Actually, you don't have a choice. <laughs> She wrote, each day on the bench, I learned something new about the judicial process and about being a professional Latina woman in a world that sometimes looks at me with suspicion. I am reminded each day that I render decisions that affect people concretely and that I owe them constant and complete vigilance in checking my assumptions, presumptions, and perspectives. We who judge must not deny the differences resulting from experience and heritage, but attempt, as the Supreme Court suggests, continuously to judge when those opinions, sympathies, and prejudices are appropriate. Justice Sotomayor, you have inspired so many people, and your leadership in our nation today is timely, relevant, and very much appreciated. We have no idea the price you're paying for the service you're doing, but I think we all recognize how important it is, and we want to thank you for that. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your courage. May I have a round of applause, one more? So now, now, I would like to invite Stephanie Angel, president of the Emory Latin American Law Student Association, to introduce the justice. Stephanie. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Today is an incredibly important day for the Emory Law community especially for those of us who identify as Latinos. As a representative of the Emory Latino community, and on behalf of all assembled here today, I would like to offer a warm welcome to the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. A native of the Bronx, Justice Sotomayor graduated summa cum laude from Princeton University, earning the university's highest academic honor. She earned a JD from Yale Law School, where she served as editor of the Yale Law Journal. Upon graduation, she served as an assistant district attorney in the New York County District Attorney's Office, where she was responsible for prosecuting robbery, assault, murder, police brutality, and child pornography cases. She entered private practice in 1984, litigating international commercial matters at Pavia and Harcourt, where she was an associate and then partner. Justice Sotomayor was nominated to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York by President George H.W. Bush. She then served as a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. In 2009, President Barack Obama nominated her to the nation's highest court. She received her appointment in August of that year, becoming the first Latina Supreme Court Justice in U.S. history. <laughs> This past summer, I participated in the Sonia and Selena Sotomayor Judicial Internship Program, which seeks to increase diversity in the legal profession by educating and empowering students from underrepresented communities and diverse backgrounds. The program exposes students to the practice of law and the judiciary through internships in state and federal courts, educational workshops, and mentorship opportunities. As a Latina law student, I don't often find myself in a room with peers, faculty, 
attorneys, or judges who look like me. The Justice explains in her book, My Beloved World, that when a young person, even a gifted one, grows up without proximate living examples of what she may aspire to become, her goals remain abstract. Justice Sotomayor serves as a proximate living example of what someone who looks like us can become. And for that, our Emory Latino community thanks her. Now, I am pleased to present to you in conversation with Emory Law Professor Fred Smith, United States Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Wow is right. Those were such beautiful remarks. I am so glad that you are here. So glad that you're in Atlanta. So glad that you're at Emory University, uh, this place that I'm so proud to call my home. And I'm looking forward to our conversation between you and I and 1,200 of our friends. <laughs> we'll let them into right. the living room. How's that? Um, what I was thinking we'll do is I'll ask a few questions and then there have been some pre-submitted questions uh, and I'll read those questions, uh, but when I do so, I'll uh, ask the student who wrote them to stand up uh, so that the justice uh, knows uh, where you are and who you are. Um, you know, so you know how fond I am of the city uh, and uh, our favorite son of all time, easily, is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, it doesn't, you know, in terms of someone who shaped uh, the identity of the city and also shaped the world, uh, he's, he's it. Uh, and one of his less famous quotes is uh, that faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. And your life, your remarkable life, includes so many moments like that, taking the first step when you can't see the whole staircase. But my first question, I want to begin, actually, um, kind of late in the journey. Um, and your first step at the United States Supreme Court, your first day there, right? So it's, it's, it's 2009, it's your first day on the job. Uh, you're literally walking up these steps. What are you thinking? What's on your mind? Take us to that moment. Oh, I wasn't walking up the steps. <laughs> I drove into the garage. <laughs> Ooh. Considering that I sort of live in garages, in and out of garages now, that ports into my future. But I went up to a makeshift office that um, they had created for me, because the building was under renovation at the time, and they didn't have an official spot for me. So they had ejected the reporters, I went into the reporter's office. Tiny, tiny little space. I fit seven people into that space um, because they had originally wanted me to send two law clerks elsewhere and I refused. As you know is my want when I don't like something. At any rate, I walked in and um, sat down and in front of me, my chair, were a few welcoming notes from some of my colleagues. I opened those first, and it's very difficult to imagine being a judge, a lawyer first, but then a judge on the lower courts, to open up these envelopes and have them signed by your now colleagues. And reading their notes to me was so incredibly touching that they took the time and made the effort. But right smack in the middle of the desk was a book about that size um, and a note from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I opened that last and it was her welcome of me to the court with an indication that the book were, were, was her chamber's manual and that she thought I might have some use for it. Um, the rest of you may not understand that a chamber's manual is generally the private creation of each judge. 
and it's a description of how their chambers work and why. For someone to share that is an act of grace and of real love to give a newcomer a guidepost to how to do their new job. And I was overwhelmed with that act of generosity. Um, but I got there very, very early. I went to the gym. I came back from the gym. And standing in my office was John Paul Stevens, the, uh, by years, the oldest member of the court. And he, I looked at him and said, Justice, I would come to you. And he looked back and said, no, you're arriving. I'm going to greet you, and you call me John from now on. I don't think I called him by name the rest of the conversation. <laughs> it's very hard to do that with someone like John Paul Stevens. But we sat talking for a little while, and all of a sudden I hear a very familiar voice in the ante room. And it is Sandra Day O'Connor, the second most senior justice, coming to greet and welcome me. And they sat together for a few minutes, and Justice Stevens left, and Sandra Day O'Connor stayed with me. Gave me invaluable advice, um, including the advice to be decisive in my decision making. That no matter how unsure I was, that the responsibility of a judge is to decide. Sound advice. I have tried to follow it since. Um, but it almost felt like, and I had been having that experience from the moment of my nomination, an outer body experience. I didn't feel like I was connected to my emotions. I was somewhere up here looking down and watching this person who I know is me, talking to these people and sort of thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> They've made a mistake. Seriously, there's a sense of disbelief in the whole emotion. Um, I spent the remainder of the day walking through the building and meeting people. I wanted to get a feel of who was behind the scenes at the Supreme Court. And so I started in the laundry room of all places. It seemed the most familiar room to me. And there are people who work there, and there are people who work in the clerk's office, and in the reporter's office. And, um, and I just went around the building meeting people. And so it wasn't probably till the first day that I got to the courtroom and sat there to hear an argument where the bigness of what I was involved in came crashing down. Mm -hmm. My first case, when the Oye Oye, the, the court crier, court marshal, um, started, I got chills down my back. And when I walked out and saw the size of the audience, I was very choked. Do you want to tell them what that case was? Ah, it was a little case. Not very important. Citizens United. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, what, and one of her first questions was not a little question, which is, perhaps our first mistake was considering corporations persons in the first place. <laughs> um, and actually, that wasn't a question that I had prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you, you were, at that moment, I mean, at that point, you've been a judge for, or well, you've now been a judge for over 25 years, uh -huh. right? Um, and uh, at that moment, you've been a federal district court judge, you've been on the Court of Appeals. Um, what's different about the Supreme Court? I mean, so you, you, you just talked about a moment where justices were telling you, giving you advice about how to be a judge. You've been a judge a long time. What's, what's, so, what's different about it? Everything and nothing. I, you, you come to judging with a set of skills, lawyer skills. You learn judging skills in terms of how to figure out what the essence of a problem is and how to sort of look at precedent and to look at the history of the legal issue. 
and look at your facts and sort of apply the principles, uh, apply the statutory tools that you've used throughout your judging experience. But there's a different focus on each level. So you start on the district court as I did, and what you figure out is that the focus of a district court judge is on the parties before that judge. You're really doing justice for those parties. You have a very clear understanding that nothing you do in that case is precedent. It is an issue and a decision that's going to affect those two parties. You might have, and most of us do, an internal drive to be consistent. Nobody likes being arbitrary and capricious. So internally, you're trying to face each legal question you reach with some sense of consistency about what you're doing and to think through the reasons why you're doing what you're doing. But it is for the parties. And so it's justice for them. You get to the Court of Appeals, and we're not permitted, generally, to review the facts of a case. We're asked to determine the law as it applies not just to those parties, but to any party in your circuit that's affected by that case. And there you're really thinking through what's the right answer for the development of law, not for the nation, but for your circuit and for the people affected by that decision within your circuit. You're doing justice for the law as you think it exists. That's a very different focus than what you're doing on the Supreme Court. Every single case we take is on the edge of the law. We don't take cases generally unless there's a circuit split. There are 13 circuits in the United States. The states are divided among those circuits. And cases perk through the circuits and they eventually reach the circuit courts, and each individual circuit court gets to pronounce what they think that case means. And until they disagree, generally we don't grant certiorari. We don't hear it. If you presume the way I do and understand that judges generally tend to be reasonable people, but reasonable people disagree. And if reasonable people are disagreeing, the cases are hard. Sometimes when we write, we make them seem simple. You can always have to, when you start reading our uh, opinions and it says, you know, if the answer is clear, I often have to laugh. Uh, <laughs> if it was so clear, there wouldn't be a split, okay? Um, but we're persuasive writers and we know how to convince people, even if we dissemble a little bit and call it something it's not. But the point is that what we're deciding is what the law should be, not what it is, because that's undefined until that moment. We're looking to the future. In what direction is the law going to go in from this moment forward? And that's a very different exercise. That's why we do so many hypotheticals at our arguments, because we're thinking about the impact of each ruling, not just in that one area, but in other related areas. And we're thinking more broadly about what's the best direction of the law in this uncertain situation. Um. I want to ask you about uh, a choice you made also early kind of in your uh, career at the Supreme Court, which was to write a book. You wrote a memoir, a very mm -hmm. inspirational memoir, My Beloved World, uh, which she has signed many copies of uh, and are available in the lobby. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, that's, that's not a common thing for a justice to spend their time doing, individually signing books. Um, but can you tell us why, why did you choose to write that book? Hmm. Now, for those few of you who may know me, uh, in the book, you'll learn that I was an active child. I never sat still. I don't like sitting still even now. So I'm going to walk around the audience. 
the only uh, thing you should be aware of is that there are all these men and women around the room whose job is to make sure that I'm safe <laughs> from myself, not from you. <laughs> they don't like when I do this, so please don't get up too unexpectedly. Because <laughs> that makes them nervous, okay? Now, the first thing I have to do is I have to greet the most important people in the room. That's Fred's parents. This is a big job, being on the Supreme Court. And with it comes a lot of power. And you've heard the old adage, adage, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And for those of you who are lawyers, you've heard why we're infallible. Not because we're right, <laughs> but because we get the last word. All of those things are very dangerous to the human condition. They can put you or distance you from people. They can give you a greater sense of self than I think anybody's entitled to have. And I got to the court, and it was a whirlwind. You know, I got nominated, and all of a sudden, I went from my sort of safety net of New York City and a smaller world in which some people knew me, now to an international world stage. And that became frightening to me. And I also didn't want to lose Sonia. And not that Sonia was great or anything like that, but something got me to where I was. And that something I knew was what values were inside of me, what had led me to make the choices I had made in life, the good things that had led me to where I'd gone. And I wanted desperately to hold on to that. And the whirlwind of attention and people and activities that I was undergoing were frightening me. And I needed to stop and sort of withdraw for a little while after my first term on the court and capture that Sonia. And that's how I conceive the book, as a way for me to identify those things that made me who I was. And I knew then and I know now and I've always known that I'm not self-made because no one is. Have you ever heard titans of business who talk about being self-made? <laughs> um, all, all of us, all of us have people who support and guide us. All of us have organizations of interlocking sometimes, interrelated groups who give us the substance of what we are. And so my book was there to capture that, to remember the moments in my time when people had stepped forward to help me, to pay tribute to the people who were so critical in my life, like my grandmother and my mother, to talk about the people who presented me with challenges and let me grow because of that. Because for me, I don't think of failures as permanent losses. I think of failures as an opportunity to learn something about how to do something the next time better. And so for me, that was the exercise of the book. It was not to forget who Sonia is. And so I've told my friends, when I start getting too conceited, 
And um, when I start putting on too many airs, it's a relatively thick book, hit me with it on the head. <laughs> and I can assure you, Fred, you know most of my friends will. All right. All right. Yeah, great. Uh, so these are my judge friends great. down this aisle, <laughs> except for one. So in, <laughs> so in thinking about um, your beginnings, can you talk a little bit about how you chose to become a lawyer and perhaps even how you chose to become a judge? Say this again. I got how you <laughs> uh, How you chose to become a lawyer as we kind of think about your beginning. Oh, I, I think most people may know I was a fan of Nancy Drew. I still love Nancy Drew, although I don't read her anymore. Um, I have her scattered all over my office. At any rate, um, she was a tech detective. And when I started reading her, I wanted to be a detective too. But then I was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. And they don't do this now, but back then, my clinic gave me a sheet of paper with a set of, you can't do this, and a list of occupations I couldn't do. But you can do this. Their intent was to show me the things I could do were better than the things I couldn't do. Not a very intelligent way to approach this. <laughs> At any rate, um, on the list of can't do's were law enforcement. Hmm. Because back then, if you had juvenile diabetes, you could not go into law enforcement. You couldn't be a truck driver. That may still be true today. Um, you can go into the military. There were other items of that nature that uh, prohibited diabetics from participating. A lot of that has changed nowadays. But on the list of can do was the word lawyer. And where in the neighborhood I grew up, there were no lawyers. There were no judges. There were police officers. But those other things were not things I was familiar with. So I remembered the list, though. Um, it was basically, basically doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, you know, that sort of list. Engineer, architect, a couple of other things like that. But it stayed in my head. And I get to be about 10 or 11, and Perry Mason comes on TV. And for those young folks here, probably half this audience, Perry Mason was the first TV lawyer with a series. And his show, the first half, he and uh, his in private investigator investigated the crime his client was charged with. In the second half of the show, he was in court proving his client innocent. Now I've been a judge now for 25 years. It's never happened before me. <laughs> I haven't read any of those cases. So it was a little unrealistic, OK? But that was the reason I decided, ah, I could be a detective like Perry Mason was. Because the private investigator did the work, but Perry led him to do the investigation that he was doing. And so it was a very unsophisticated reason <laughs> for identifying law as my profession. But it gave me hope that I could do something and do something that seemed exciting to me. As I grew up and started my life and started getting more involved in uh, high school and in college, it became clear to me that there was something about what Perry did that appealed to me. Yes, it was getting his clients off. But as I began to understand that it wasn't merely that that was a happy ending, but that it was the function of what being a judge was about. It was about helping people. That's what lawyers do. And they help people in a particular way. They help people in their relationships with one another. And here I use people in its corporate sense and natural sense. People help people with relationships. 
whether it's against each other or with each other. Because most lawyers never go into court. Lots of lawyers are just helping people in their transactions with one another, improving their business relationships, improving their other uh, contractual relationships, or they help each other or they help people with institutions, employees with employers, or students with their teachers, or parents with those students' teachers. It's the relationship that law is helping to regulate. And it is the quality of that relationship that the law is attempting to improve. And I realized that that's what law does. It helps us create our relationship with one another. Sometimes imperfectly. Sometimes in ways we're perfectly content with. So you all like red and green lights, right? You all give up something for it. You don't get to where you're going as fast as you would like. But the trade-off seems very natural to you. We all wait at a red light for a few minutes so the greater number of people can get to where they're going more safely. That's simple law, right? Simple logic, simple give up, and most people are happy with it. But then the laws get more complex because some people give up more than others. And some people start to feel that that give up is too burdensome. Or others feel that they're taking too much. And that's what the law is also trying to calibrate. Those competing interests and where we settle that line and how we settle it. And for me, that's the joy of what I do because I'm a participant in sort of setting some of those lines, because each time we settle a little legal issue, we've moved the line to a certain place where people are gonna know that the law will protect them up to here, but not that far. But all of that is part of the law's beauty in relationships and governing them and helping them. So what's your part in that. Well, laws don't just get made. Laws are made by people. They're made by people for themselves. The people who promote laws are the people who believe that this law will further what they think is in their better interest. And so we as citizens have an obligation to be participants in that conversation. And those issues that are important to us, we have to go out there and, I use a really negative word, lobby for them. <laughs> We've got to work on doing the work to make this a better place, to improve our relationships with one another. They just don't happen. They get created by people. And so those relationships that are not working if you're upset by them, you've got to do something about it. And that's basically my message about what law is about. It's the participation, not just of lawyers and judges and people affected by laws, but it's the participation of the people who create those laws and make them. And so we're an integral part of each other. And that's how, Fred, I stayed in law. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you just talked about uh, relationships and the ways that the law attempts to sort of organize us and uh, kind of keep us, uh, keep, keep us able to be in relative harmony. At least that's one of the goals of the law. Um, but in, in terms of relationships between uh, one another, not everyone is equally situated. Um, and I wonder uh, if you can talk a little bit about um, any moments, if ever, in your life um, that you felt like an outsider rather than an insider. Most of my life. <laughs> I don't think there's been a time where I felt completely a part of any of the worlds I inhabit. Perhaps as a child I did. But even then, um, my diabetes, the fact that I was taking insulin shots and, um, and couldn't do some of the things 
that my cousins did as freely as they could made me feel a little bit different and a little bit apart. But then I end up in a place like Princeton University, which, by the way, I adore. I served as a part of the board of trustees there. So anything I say should not be read as an indictment of any kind. <laughs> um, but I felt like an alien in a different universe. Here's a kid from the South Bronx. There were some trees in the project, but they were isolated. <laughs> Uh, my complex was a new complex in the South Bronx. Um, and as a result, the grass hadn't really grown yet. And most of it was dirt. And there was a lot of broken glass. So we had a field, but you could barely play in it. And even then, it's not a, it was unsafe neighborhood. My mom wouldn't let us walk down the stairs. We had to always take the elevator. You couldn't be outside in the dark, so you had to come in before night fell. Most of the time, I was accompanied by an adult to go do anything. Uh, it wasn't the safest neighborhood in the world. And here I go to the beauty of Princeton, and there's trees and grass everywhere. And I have classmates who are talking about their summer vacations in exotic places. What did I visit as a kid? Puerto Rico. Not so unexotic, but Puerto Rico and Camden, New Jersey, where some of my mother's family lived, okay? Um, and to hear them talking about being in Europe, um, the private schools that they had gone to, the projects that they had done. It was, you know, I, my first day. I sat outside of Dylan Gym, which was then Princeton's big gym. And I'm sitting next to this young woman who was from Alabama. And I am very horrible at repeating accents, but could you imagine a heavy southern accent? <laughs> and she was telling me how proud and pleased she was to be at Princeton. Her great-grandfather had been there, her grandfather had been there, her father, her brothers. And now they had finally admitted women, and she was the first woman there. And I'm sitting next to her thinking to myself, I'm the first one in my family to go to a college like this. And I'm thinking, I don't belong here. And I spent my four years feeling like I didn't belong. And that's been my life experience. Every step I've taken was Martin Luther King's uh, statement about a step beyond which I don't know. But it seemed like the right thing to do because I was told by a friend that Princeton was among the top schools in the nation. And that would open the door of opportunity for me in a way other things wouldn't. And so I took a leap of faith. It was the one that my mother had taught me, which is with education, you can do anything. She was right. But that sense of being, of not fitting, it has followed me to the Supreme Court. You know, um, I don't know when the who in the White House decided to tell the press that I love opera. <laughs> I don't love opera. <laughs> I love dance. But all of my other colleagues love opera. They like classical music. I like jazz. <laughs> you know, um, those are small differences. Okay. And, and they're not, in the larger scheme of life, that important, those differences. But they make you feel a little bit like an outsider. Not a little bit, a lot sometimes. So what, and, do, sorry. what do you do? What advice do you have to people in the room who uh, might sometimes feel like outsiders. What I have to remind myself every day, which is I may not belong 100%, but I'm there. <laughs> and I mean that in a very positive way. 
they have to deal with me too. <laughs> Just as in the same way that I have to get to know them and learn how to work with them and learn their life and their ways, I have an opportunity to show them mine. That's part of writing my book. Justice Breyer said to me after he read my book, gosh, I think I know you now. That was scary. Um, <laughs> but I think I understood what he meant. Um, and it's what I try to do in each of the environments I've been in. I was a student leader at Princeton um, on behalf of many issues, including greater admissions of Latinos. Uh, I played a part of somewhat important part in getting Princeton to hire its first Latino administrator. It had none. Um, but I did other things as well. I was on the University Discipline Committee and I worked with the Dean of Students on a variety of different projects. I did those things because I wanted to promote the issues that were important to me. And when you're in those situations, you have to do some of that. You have to use the things you're comfortable with, like your ethnicity, your culture. You have to use them to give you an anchor, to make you a sense of some feeling of comfort and not aloneness in this new world you're in. But you can't use it as a wall to block you off from the larger society you're in. You have to get to know the people around you. They're learning from you, you have to learn from them. You have to become integrated in the world you're in. Otherwise, you're losing the opportunity to grow, to become a better and more interesting person, to learn skills that can help you with the issues that are important to you. And you're not gonna learn those by just staying in a small enclave of people. You learn them by participating as broadly as you can in the world that you're in, while staying anchored to those things and values that are important to you. It's a tightrope. It's not one that's easy to do, but it's so critical to do, to reach out and understand that in the end, we're in this together. In the end, when we create a better world for our group, we create a better America. But you can't do that if you're excluding America from working with you to get there. And so for me, yes, I'm a voice in the room. And I may not always convince people of what I'm thinking, but at least I'm trying. And sometimes, just like when your mother says no, and you keep talking to her. <laughs> and a few weeks later, she says, okay, maybe you can do that. That's what happens in a larger conversation. Sometimes you get no's for a long time. And after a while, the no's become a maybe. And the maybe becomes a point of compromise. And eventually you get a yes that leads you a little place better. So. That's how I've dealt with that. Um, so in terms of kind of making the job yours and sort of kind of you know, having your voice and having your perspective um, shape the, the role, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of witnessing one way that you do that. I don't think any other justice <laughs> does what you're doing right now. Um, but last night you were telling me about a project uh, that you did that I wasn't aware of kind of early uh, in your tenure um, with respect to rule of law in Latin America. Oh. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Justice Breyer, when I came to the court, said, I've had an idea for 25 years or longer, and I can't make it work. I hope you can make it work. So I said, what's the idea? And he came and he said, I've always thought that the best place to do judicial training for Latin American and Caribbean countries is Puerto Rico, because virtually everybody's bilingual. You have the state system, which is civil law system, which is what most Latin America has. And you have the federal system, which is our system. Um, the professors, the judges, everybody there can actually talk to these judges in their own language. This should be a great place to do judicial studies. So, but I haven't been able to interest anybody. 
said, okay, I will always credit you with the idea, which I am. <laughs> so I went out and beat the bushes. I will next. Um, yes, Fred, did you hear that? Yes. Talk about I civics next. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I beat the bushes and I got two people in the Department of State and Department of Justice to help create the Judicial Studies Institute in Puerto Rico. It's the only uh, program that the two law schools of Puerto Rico work on jointly. There is no other project that they've done together. And the federal and the state courts are working together in training judges from Latin America. We've gotten judges from something like 14 countries now. And some countries like Mexico and Colombia are sending judges regularly. We try to keep it as a very practical exercise. We keep politics out of it. We do do some ethics training. I actually go once a year to one of the classes and talk about ethics. They have others who do it when I'm not there. But we work on uh, writing opinions, on evidentiary rulings, on case management, and we try to train those judges to train the judges in their home country. And it's been working, actually. Um, it has grown quite large. We tend to have five to six seminars a year. So it's almost every other month we're bringing judges from Latin America in. So I've been very proud of that enterprise. So I know that, uh, that education is very important to you more generally uh, when it comes to issues of civics and so forth. And uh, you've gotten to uh, get involved in some work here with respect to youth uh, and civics. Uh, if you can talk uh, some about that project, the iCivics right. project. So I'm really good at taking people's ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I take ideas from anybody if they're good ideas. So I've taken Justice Sandra Day O'Connor's initiative, iCivics, and have now tried to expand it to reach more inner city school kids who have reading and language difficulties. iCivics is a game program. I challenge everyone in this room to go on iCivics.org and play a couple of the games. I bet most of you don't score 100%. I bet. And if you don't, then play all the games, okay? <laughs> but um, it's geared towards middle schoolers. When I came on board, Justice O'Connor was stepping back from active participation, and they asked me to join the board. And I did on one condition. I wanted to ensure that we worked on kids where, uh, who had English as a second language and kids who had reading disabilities. And I wanted iCivics to start looking at their needs and incorporating some solutions for those kids into the games. So they had a meeting of experts in, uh, in the field who began to point out to us the difficulties that many of the games had for kids, from second kids with English as a second language, including um, idioms that are used in the game. Um, try translating, throw the book at them <laughs> from English to Spanish. Most kids would see that sentence and go, why are we throwing a book at them? <laughs> All right. Um, but it turns out that idioms are just as hard for kids with dyslexia or with other reading disorders because many kids are literal. So if you use an idiom, they get lost in the game. These are things we learned from the experts. So what have we done? We've translated the first of the games, um, Do I Have a Right, into Spanish. And the kids are having so much fun learning from the Spanish. Because they go into the Spanish game, they figure out what's going on, and then they go into the English. And this has been happening first in Florida, because Florida requires the kids to pass the test in English. So they know they can master it in Spanish, but then go back and learn it in English because they know what they're doing. We have a whole syllabus for teachers on how to help the kids with the idioms. We have a little button they can push where they can look at what that word means if they don't know, or that phrase if they don't know. So the hope is to translate all 18 games. 
to start working more on updating all of the games so we're creating syllabi in multiple languages and getting out the things that we're learning about how to teach kids. It's also why civics is now moving into high schools and we're presenting lesson plans for high school teachers. Um, and most of all, we're trying to get iCivics to de develop lesson plans for how to take what kids are learning in the classroom and to take on local projects to try to improve their communities. And so, one of the examples we use, you need a stoplight somewhere. Go teacher, find out what the requirements are to get a, sp a, a stoplight in your jurisdiction. Then figure out what information the kids can then get. Make it either a single year or multiple year project, but carry it through so that you can show the kids how to make a difference. Um, and so that was an initiative that I was very much behind and really think will be important to get iCivics moving. Um, it's clear from what I said to you earlier, I believe in our involvement. I believe with all of my heart that unless we become engaged in our country, and become active participants in making a difference in the world we're in, that we will be nothing but bystanders otherwise. And nobody should live their life being a bystander. We are here for a reason. Every one of us can make a contribution to bettering the world. You, but you have to have the heart to do it. And you have to have the energy and desire to leave behind the legacy greater than merely standing on the sidelines. And so that's my involvement in iCivics because it touched the chord in me that the best place to start making good citizens is in grammar school. You know, if we're waiting to do it to adults, we fail. But you and you, you're gonna do bigger things than me. That's what I expect, okay? Well, we have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to turn to audience questions. Go ahead. Uh, so our first question is from Tyler Yergen, uh, who's a student. Uh, are if you you're in the, here, get right? up because Perfect. you, ah, okay. <laughs> Come on out as he's talking. <laughs> and the question is, when your colleagues criticize your opinions, how do you avoid taking it personally? <sighs> oh, you do. I mean, you feel badly. But most of the time when they're criticizing your opinion, it's because they're dissenting. And they lost. <laughs> uh, no, seriously. The harshest, harshest criticism comes from dissenters. And that's because everybody's passionate about their views. And all of us, are equally involved in believing in the Constitution, in law, the rule of law, in our system of government. We just disagree on what's the best answer to promote those things, but our passion is the same. And so the greatest criticisms always seem to come from the losers, because what they really want to do is shake you and say to you, can't you see? You know, Justice Kennedy one day said to me, when I came to the court, I thought, you know, reason will win out every single time. It didn't work that way. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Reasonable people disagree. And so it's much easier if you're being criticized by a dissenter to forgive and forget. And I will say that there have been a couple of my colleagues who have written dissents that I could have strangled them for you. <laughs> and if you had let me, I would have. Yeah. Um, but I need their vote for the next case. <laughs> you? you have to be practical. You've got to live with people, you know? 
uh, you got to exist in, in, for us it's clearer, we're nine people, we have to live together for the rest of our lives. <laughs> so we have to find a way to manage that anger and to, you know, sort of channel it to a more productive discussion. And that's how we do it. Now, when you're being the dissenter and being criticized by a majority, that gets to be really hard. But I think the same principles apply, which is you have to recognize, you have to have respect that people have opinions for reasons. Sometimes they can't articulate them. And you may have to spend some time sort of delving through what they're saying to try to figure out what they mean and why. But that's our job as human beings, to not assume that people are malicious by nature or unkind or ungiving. But generally, people hold different opinions because they're afraid of something. And if you can identify that fear and address it in some way, you have a greater chance of reaching a compromise. But a lot of times people have conversations where it's either or. And that vast expanse of the middle gets lost. Um, sometimes because of perceptions of power differences. Sometimes because of perce perceptions of un inherent unfairness. But you still have to reach compromise to be able to make effective change. Because if you don't address someone else's fears in some meaningful way, whatever change you do will get undermined. Um, that's what backlash is about. Um, so all of those things are very much how I manage with disagreement to still come to an agreeable ending. Great. All right, the next question is from Juan Pablo Alfora Castilla. Juan? Ah. All right. And the question is, as a Hispanic justice, how important do you think diversity is in the legal arena, and particularly in the Supreme Court? What do you think is the best way to promote and eventually increase diversity? Well, we have to talk about what diversity means before I, that question can be answered, okay? Um, certainly, you want gender, ethnic, racial diversity. Um, why? Because there is a simple truth that when people walk into, and Stephanie said it in her introduction, when you walk into a system and you don't see anybody who looks like you in any position, it undermines confidence in that system. Um, now, no system is going to be as diverse as our country is. We have people from around the world, we have groups of so many different kinds that it's always going to be an uneven match. And that includes particularly the Supreme Court. There's only nine of us. And we're never going to represent all nine of us, the diversity of our population. But you can make an effort to ensure that it appears representative of a larger group than an insular group. We've got a little problem with that. Not with just color and race and gender, but life experiences. Every justice on the Supreme Court comes from an Ivy League school. Uh, you know, someone asked me the other day, one of my colleagues, why does that make a difference? Well, there is a difference between being educated in a state-funded system and understanding the limitations that that uh, creates in the quality of education and the opportunity of education from an Ivy League school where you basically get to do what you want. That doesn't exist in the larger world. And understanding that and understanding how it impacts policy choices I think is important for a lot of the cases where the justices are being asked to do things. That holds true for the criminal, uh, the criminal law. The only justice with a tiny bit of experience in criminal defense work is Justice Kennedy. And he, for one, will tell you he may be dealt with a handful of cases. We have no other justice who has done criminal defense work. It's a real problem. 
you've got a lot of prosecutors and not one person on the other side. All right? We have federal prosecutors, only one with state law experience. There's a huge difference between what happens in the state system, the volume of cases, the greater variety of types of issues. Because in federal law, we don't deal with certain questions that are, we consider state law questions, like usually matrimonial questions, child custody questions, lots of other questions that we don't handle in federal court, but state courts do. We have nobody with that kind of experience, just me. And that was as a state prosecutor. Immigration. No justice on my court has had experience with it. Environmental law. No justice has had direct experience with it. I could go on and on about the lack of experience represented in our court. We were a court of Catholics and uh, Jewish faith adherents. We have now one Protestant. There's a whole lot of other religions in this country. Does, should that make a difference? None of this should make a difference, but I happen to think it affects the quality of the conversation. It's a richer, broader conversation when you have people from different experiences participate. And so for me, I worry more about that now, the lack of diversity with respect to life experiences than I do about the gender and racial. And no one should mistake my saying that to believe I think we're at an ideal state. I just think we have a lot of work to do in a lot more levels than it's normally thought about. And then we have, a, uh, I think this will probably be our last question. It's from Cody Long. Hello, Cody. Thank you for being up front. Thank you. <laughs> And the question is, how do you as a justice of the Supreme Court balance your personal views, upbringing, and opinions with your duty to interpret the Constitution? Do you think these personal qualities hinder or assist your ability to accurately interpret the Constitution? Well, I think Stephanie, um, Stephanie or Madam President, um, read a statement by me that encapsulated my feelings about it. You know, if I went into a room, uh, a conference, and said to my colleagues, I'm going to vote for that person because they're poor, and I was poor, and that's how hard their life is, well, I'm not going to get any votes. And I'm not going to convince anybody of what they should be doing according to law. Because that's not what the function of law is to try to do justice for a poor person. The purpose of law is to try to do justice for people. And every case involves competing interests among people. And if people believe that I made decisions based on my personal predilections alone, they would stop respecting the law. Because that really is arbitrary, isn't it? You're lucky enough to have me as a judge. You're unlucky enough to get the other guy because nobody's following the law. People are just following what they think is right, subjectively right. You have to have, the way I do, a fundamental belief that the law is society's imperfect way of trying to balance competing interests. And sometimes that balance won't arrive at where you're going or want to go but you have to follow it in order to let the system survive. And you have to rely on the other actors in this larger society to get those things that I think are right done. So I rely on the civil rights groups, on the lobbyists for the poor, on the social networks that we have to try to remedy those problems. And so it's inappropriate for me to use those aspects of my life to determine an outcome of any case. Is it inappropriate, and I happen not to think of it this way, for me to let my experience suggest that certain beliefs I might have may be different than the reality? 
So I give two prime examples. Uh, a few years back, we had a cell phone search case. And one of our justices asked the opposing lawyer who was representing a defendant whether there was anybody besides someone involved in drugs who had two cell phones. <laughs> I turned to the colleague beside me and said, I do. <laughs> and the lawyer in front of him does. Because every government lawyer has two cell phones. Because they beat into you that you can't use your cell phone, your government cell phone, for personal business. So everybody has two phones. And if you're smart and you work for a company who gives you a cell phone, you should have two cell phones. Because <laughs> you're not reading the fine print. They can search your phone. And they can involve themselves in all of your intimate uh, matters if they choose. And you say, oh, they'll never choose. Uh-huh. <laughs> the books are full of their choosing, OK? Sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not, but they do. So did that make a difference in that justice's outcome of the case? It didn't, because there were other justices there who pointed out their life experiences, and that misperception got corrected. But there was a case involving a 13-year-old girl in a school that had a no-drug policy. And there had been a triple hearsay. You don't know what hearsay means. <laughs> if you're a witness and you say, I did this, you know you did it, right? But your mother sees it, OK, she can tell her. She'll tell her mother. But she won't tell her mother, I didn't see it. Marcella did this. Your mother will tell her, and she'll tell her. That's all hearsay, because they didn't see it. And the problem with hearsay is that people who don't see things, they sometimes add things, and sometimes they take away things, OK? <laughs> not, they're not trying to lie. They just don't know. Anyway, that's what happened with this little girl in school. Somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody who told somebody. Who told somebody and somebody told the principal that she had taken a drug. Um, it turned out the drug was an aspirin. All right? But the school searched the girl. And the case was before the Supreme Court, because it was a public school. And the issue was, could they search you in a public school without real evidence? And hearsay, triple hearsay, is not real evidence. And so we had to decide that. And some of my male colleagues, I wasn't there at the time. It's been reported. You can read the transcript. We're asking questions that suggesting that this search of the girl was like boys undressing in the locker room. Justice Ginsburg was refuted to have said after um, to a bunch of people, I don't think my male colleagues knows what it feels like to be a 13-year-old girl who wants to protect the integrity of her body. She was right. Now, did that change the decision? No, I don't think so. But what it did stop was any justice writing an opinion that said, you know, this search isn't that bad. It's like undressing in a locker room. If any justice had written that, it would have been insulting to every young woman who read that decision. And it would have been insulting to women in general. So that richness of conversation, of life experience, has a place in ensuring not necessarily how we come to outcome, but in understanding the arguments of what we're dealing with. If you haven't experienced the pain, you may not know how deep it runs, how searing it can be, and how life-altering it is. If you're experienced it, you can tell people that. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to or always changes outcomes, but affects the quality of the work we're doing and ensures that the outcome is expressed in ways that are not hurtful 
and that, are, and that recognize what is affecting people in a negative way. You know, we often write ex opinions where we're talking about sensitive life topics, and you will see both sides recognizing the unhappiness of the losing side. We do that because we recognize there is pain involved. And we explain our decisions in the hope that despite the pain, people will appreciate what our thinking was. We are really the only branch of government that does that. We explain fully every decision we arrive at. Now, I'm in a room full of lawyers, and I bet how many people have read a Supreme Court decision from cover to cover? It's not every hand in this room. Even law students, often you don't read them cover to cover, you get excerpts, right? Most people react to our outcomes. Very few people spend the time and the energy it requires to actually read what we write and think about the debate that our opinions always engage in. Next time you don't like something the Supreme Court has done, read it first. Thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. Uh, I hope that you all thought so too. Uh, it's so, so, so incredibly riveting um, as a thinker uh, and as a speaker and most importantly as a human being. Um, so thank you so, so much for that. Um, we do have a small uh, token of our appreciation from uh, Emory University. I'll actually confess, I don't know what's in it. I have no idea. Um, but I'm sure that it's wonderful. <laughs> You notice this. Yep, I got a t-shirt. I love t-shirts. I wear them at the gym. And uh, I got Advancing the Rule of Law, a Century of Excellence at Emory Law. I like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank, thanks to each of you, all right? Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for, uh, I hope that today you leave a little bit more inspired uh, with respect to the way that the law uh, operates in a way that actually organizes relationships, but also that uh, the law is human, right? That's kind of what, one of the things I took away. Um, and I hope that each of you is a little more inspired to take a first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. So thank you for being here today. And uh, thank you.